for a friend of ours, Leo, who had lost his uh, his wife to um, cancer. And um, they were a really great couple. Um, and he talked about being able to, see, he didn't want to wash the sheets because he could smell her on the sheets, you know. And so um, it hurts when we lose those we love. But this is for Leo. shine today the car won't start but I'll put my left foot and move my right foot Leo Sorrentino He's been our friend for a long time. Um, I have a funny story about Leo. Uh, that Leo and I used to live. I met Leo in like 19, probably 79, something like that. And uh, there, it was the time where we were all in school and in college. And there were four of us that shared a house that my parents owned that they rented us. And... Um, it was in the middle of this avocado grove. It was this interesting place um, in a city called Hacienda Heights outside of, in Southern California and um, a little bit north of Orange County. And uh, so, you know, we're four college guys in this big house and it was, you know, chaos. Uh, I mean, it was complete chaos all the time. And, um, you know, we'd constantly be playing jokes on each other and, one time these guys, somebody broke in, you know, and I was down. I had the bedroom downstairs, and, and uh, somebody, had, uh, somebody had come in in my room, and I just thought it was one of those guys. And so then I fell back asleep. I go, get out of here, you know, and I fell back asleep. And then 
woke up a couple hours later and both of our doors are open and all this stuff is gone. They took our stereo and they took all this, you know, and they had, but they left the rent money. We had a bunch of rent money. We had like $1,000 in rent money laying on the table and they missed it. But they took things like peanut butter and a thing of Mountain Dew and um, fortunately they took the minute work record that was on the stereo because none of us, none of us liked that except for one, this one guy that lived with us, Chris. Um, but we were, there was always something going on like that. And, and uh, one night, one day I, wa- I, I wake up and I'm going in to take a shower and I look at my toilet and there's this huge fish. I kid you not, it's about this big and it's sticking and laying in my toilet. And I'm like, what the heck, you know? And so those guys come in and they're all laughing and, you know, Leo had put it there. They had went into the store and bought the biggest fish they could find, you know, and put it in my toilet. And so they all go, they, uh, they had to go to work early, and I was working later that night, and, and um, Leo had ridden to work with somebody, so I got, he had this really cool Camaro, like a 65 Camaro, 66 Camaro, and he was starting to fix it up, you know. So I took the fish, and I went and took his, in the trunk, took his spare tire out, and I put the fish under the spare tire, you know, and then put it back in there. And so, and so, and so the, it was in there for literally, it was probably about, I don't know, 10 days. <laughs> it was in there. And uh, so Leo had a date, you know, and he had this da- first, <laughs> first time date with this girl, and he, they were going out, and he was all excited about it. And she made him take him home because his car smelled so bad, <laughs> so he didn't get to finish the date. And then, uh, um, when, then the next night, we were all going out, hanging out, and one of our friends had, one of our friends had had too much to drink, and he st- he's going, what does that smell, and he's going, Leo, I'm getting sick, I'm getting sick, he goes, pull over, and of course, before we could pull over, he laid it all out in the, in the car, so not only did he have a rotten fish in his car, he had this guy's stuff in his car, and, and finally, we told him, and he, he was not, uh, he was not a happy camper, so, and I kept my door locked, I actually went and got a second lock to put on my bedroom door so that he wouldn't uh, do anything. But there was all, always stuff like that going on with Leo. He was, he was a really fun guy. Um, but anyway, enough of that. This song is for, um, it's for my dad. He uh, passed away in 2017. World War II vet and uh, Korea War vet and uh, Pentecostal preacher. I was raised in in a little Pentecostal church. It's, it's just a very interesting combination. He was a really good guy. He was one of the good ones. Um, and everything in the story was, is true, He, except for the 44 Ford. We, Steve wrote f- it, he, that he had a 44 Ford, but then Steve's dad brought up the fact that f- Ford didn't make cars in 44 because of the war. So there's no such thing as a 44 Ford. Um, but my dad, you know, he went... Uh, 80 years old, he, he bungee dived, and um, for his 85th birthday, he jumped out of an airplane, and uh, stuff like that. He was like a real fireball. So I got to spend a few years with him before he passed away. I went out to L.A. to take care of him, and it was uh, one of the best times of my life. We just would talk, and I'd sit on the couch, and he had this chair that I bought him that he would just sit there, and he would tell me World War II stories, and he never talked about stuff like that before. So he'd tell me all these different stories, and so... Steve came out, and we were listening to him talk about all these different stories, and he, he said, we've got to write a song about that. And so we ended up writing a song called Your Chair. Eleven years old and 36. Barefoot down at 66. After all the things you did and saw You're still a hick from Arkansas You joined the Navy at 17 Got in a brawl with some drunk Marines In the brig a time or two Got eleven Haitian green tattoos Well, I've been with you To the South Pacific 
patrol in the Tokyo Bay Landed a plane with a flash of light in a field in my way And when the runaway 44 Ford rolled into Bakersfield We weren't scared, me riding on the sofa You sitting in your chair Way to spread the word with a pretty little redhead who sang like a bird. Tool belt wearing preacher man with a tender heart, callous hands. Well, I've been with you to the South Pacific, patrolling the Tokyo Bay. Before Ford rolled into Bakersfield, we were scared. Me riding on the sofa, you sitting in your chair. You bungee dived You went parachuting At 85 But you're feeling the pain At 92 And that's why I'm sitting here now With you And there never was a son Who loved his father More than I in the Tokyo Bay I'm so glad they have these iPads now where you can read the lyrics. I still, f I still don't read them right, but um, it's better than, I used to make up stuff, Steve would get so mad at me. <laughs> so we'd be on tour, it'd be about the 40th show we played and I'd get up and still not know the lyrics to the song. I could remember Brandy, You're a Fine Girl, but I couldn't remember the song we just wrote three months before, so. Um, all right, let's see. Well, I was, uh, like I uh, said before, I was raised Pentecostal, and that was quite an experience. It was, uh, uh, first memories I have of life were, were uh, waking up underneath a piano at one of those all-night singing things, you know. And um, <coughs> my mother was <coughs> a musician. Her and her side of the family were all musicians, and she played you know, piano, guitar, and she played pedal steel, and she played banjo, and there were instruments all around our house all the time. And uh, so it was a, it was an interesting upbringing. I spent, once I hit my 20s, I spent a long time trying to distance myself from it. Um, and as a kid, I was kind of embarrassed by it because we were a very southern Southern Pentecostal Church transplanted into Southern California, so we're, there was the, the real cultural divide of uh, a bunch of people from Alabama and Mississippi and Oklahoma and Arkansas, and then 
Southern California. And, uh, but then in my 20s, I started re re kind of reevaluating all the good times that, that we had, and especially being a preacher's kid because you're kind of the center of attention, and I like that a lot. Um, well, I used to like it a lot. I'm not that much of that way now, but, you know, we'd, I'd always get in trouble. It was like there was always trouble brewing in the church, and it was usually because of me and my cohorts. Um, we had a guy that <coughs> his name was Brother Stone Lake, but we called him Stony. And he would sit in the front row, and he would take off his shoes every service. And um, so almost every service, we would sit in the back, and we'd crawl down under the benches. And we'd take his shoes, and we'd go. And it was like a thing that went on and on all the time. And finally, my dad had kind of had enough of it, you know. And he's like in full Pentecostal preach mode and just loud, and everything's going, and people are speaking in tongues, and... I'm crawling down, I'm about to grab the shoes, and all of a sudden they, it goes quiet, you know, and I'm like sitting there looking around, and I see my dad's face underneath the bench, and he goes, Daryl Edmund, which is what I got called whenever I was in trouble, he goes, come up and sit on the stage, please. He goes, I apologize to the congregation for my son here. Um, and man, I got it when I got, I was, I, I was like about 10 years old, and I got it bad when I got home. And, and um, my grandmother lived with us, so I would a lot of times get it twice, you know. During the day, it would be like during the day I'd do something, and then she'd, she'd take it out, you know, she'd get the switch, you know. It's like, it was a whole different time. You know, I could sue now and make a lot of money, but um, back then, you know, you couldn't do anything like that. But she, man, she loved me to death, but man, she'd get that switch, and it would be like, oh, man. And then I'd have to wait knowing my dad was coming home, you know, that I was going to get it again, and He'd laugh, you know, he'd laugh, and he'd go, oh, here we go, round two, Derry, come on. And, you know, and I'd go in, get the switch again. But um, but there was a lot of really fun, fun things about it, and I, I learned uh, basically how to survive in all kinds of different cultures because eventually the church became not just Southern Pentecostal church, but it was, it, it was a real reflection of the area. It was African Americans and Hispanics and uh, a lot of Asians started coming. And it was, it was a great, really great experience at that point in my, in my late teenage and early twenties. It was a really, really great experience. Um, but I wouldn't recommend being raised Pentecostal. It's, it, it's not, uh, it's not great. Yeah. So if you have, I apologize, I apologize. For all of us, I'm gonna do a song. I gotta retune here a little bit. Um, how many know Richard Thompson? Sing. <laughs> song that uh, I did on I have a record called uh, Hush Sorrow that I did this on it's like a lot of covers on that <laughs> it's called Withered and Die this cruel country has driven me down
Questions or anything? Anything you need to know? Nothing? Huh? Where did I go to college? I went. I started out at Pacific Christian College, thinking I wanted to be a youth pastor, and that <laughs> that uh, dream died in about halfway through the first semester. So um, I went to a school called Golden West in Southern California to get a degree in um, audio engineering. And I went two years there and then got a job at a studio uh, owned by Maranatha Music. And so I didn't finish my last two years, but I talked to my counselor and he was like, look, you're going you're gonna to learn more working at a real studio than you are here anyway, so might as well go take it. So I did. And it's been studio life and touring from then on. So, yeah. Uh, for, for the choir, choir, you mean? For anything you worked on. Choir. Oh, for anything, anything I worked, you worked on. on that you think, man, this is the really deepest cut for us. We haven't hmm. heard this. Something you think is really underplayed that if we all heard it today, we would just be. Oh. I told you I had some. I had some help. Yeah, there, I don't have. There's nothing like. There's nothing like that. No, I. Um, I hate everything I've ever worked on. So. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah the Warbler's definitely one of my favorite. favorite. That would be one that is some, some of my favorite guitar work I've ever done was on that song. And Steve wanted it, he wanted it to be real acoustic sounding and I took it in a whole different direction and he still hasn't forgiven me. <laughs> he, uh, he put it on his record, he put it the way he wanted it. But uh, that's some of my favorite guitar work I've done on that. Um, there we go. <laughs> We can just play. We can just play. We can just play records. Come on. It was your song. I was trying to find a song on my iPhone. There you go. I like listening parties. So how many have how many have record players, stereos? Everybody at this point still. Yeah. Yeah. My son that he wanted to explore vinyl, and he said, "This is really cool. It's Bluetooth." And I'm like. Kind of defeats the <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or like the guys with the USB turntables. As much as I like burning stuff to see, you know, to to my computer or whatever, but I always I have like two turntables. I have one USB, and then I have the sacred one that is for only home listening. You know, I remember my son when he was really little. He was about oh gosh, he's probably about four years old, five years old, and and. Uh, I had gotten my record collection out of storage finally. We got these bookshelves and I had put all my albums up 
and I was playing, going to put one on the turntable, and he's sitting there watching me, you know, and he's looking at it, and he comes over, and he picks up the thing, and he's looking at it, and I go, well, you got to hold it, you know, you can't, don't touch the grooves in there, and he's holding, and he goes, man, Dad, he goes, how did you guys used to get this in the car? <laughs> it's like, no, son, it's not a big, giant CD. <laughs> <laughs> I, remember when, I remember when Sharp came out with the vertical turntable, and that was like, oh, oh yeah. Well, I, I, you know, here's a story. Now, here's kind of a little cool little story. My, um, I had a, uh, my parents had this old reel-to-reel record uh, recorder. When I was a kid, I was like, this is like probably 1968, 69. And um, they got me, uh, for Christmas, they got me one of those little portable little turntables that had the speaker in it, you know? It's about, it was like, a, it, it basically only played 45s. You couldn't play an LP on it. And so I would, my, I still have tapes of me being this DJ, you know? And I would put a thing on and I'd talk about it, you know, as it's playing. And it would record from that speaker into the speaker on the recorder, you know? And it just sounds like crap, but, um, but I got my first stereo. My parents got me my first real stereo when I, I was like 13 for my birthday, and it was interesting because they actually picked out a really good stereo, and it was like, I would have never thought them, uh, well, they weren't, they just got lucky. I think the guy, I think the guy saw a couple, of, you know, rubes coming and decided he was gonna sell them some great, good stereo. And we had, in our house, we had this, the, I don't know if any of you guys are old enough to have had this, but we had the living room and the living room was off limits to everybody. The only time people sat in the living room was if you had company. But the living room had the great big console TV with the tube stereo, it was a Marantz. And it was a great stereo. And so it was like, it, I would get in tr so much trouble because I would sneak in there, you know, and I would put on the stereo, and of course I'd, have it real soft at first, and then it would get, I'd turn it up louder and louder, and then my grandmother who lived with us would come in and run me out, you know. And then she'd get a, and they used to rake the carpet for some reason. They'd vacuum and then they'd rake. And so she'd, you know, the minute I left, she'd have that rake out there raking the carpet, you know, and then you, when your father gets home, when your dad gets home, he's gonna hear about this. You're playing, you cannot play with that stereo. So they got me my own, and it, it at night, it would like I would leave it on to, to uh, just fall asleep to, and it had these blue lights. The meters were blue lights, and they would kind of glow in the room, you know. And and I remember just falling asleep, and it was right when FM was coming into its own, and so you had the AM radio, and and for a lot of a lot of you know, even a lot of twenty somethings, they're like the difference between AM radio or FM radio. It's they never really experienced that whole thing. And AM was like the loud DJs, you know. It's like, hey, come on, we're gonna rock this, and, you know. And and then the FM guys were all the hippies that smoked dope. And so it it was like transfer over about sunset, you know. And it was like the FM channels, and they would be like, okay, hey man, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna play the whole Pink Floyd, new Pink Floyd from beginning to end. He goes, kick, kick back and just let it take you where it takes you, man. Just come on, and. Uh, so I would, you know, listen to a FM at night, and you could hear anything. I'd wake up in the middle of the night, and it would be like, you know, rocket man burning down the fuel up here alone, you know, and I'd, I'd fall back asleep, and then I'd wake up again, and it would be like, wish you were here was playing. It was like this great, really, really great stuff. Well, at one point we had, in LA, right about that time, we had this big, huge earthquake. It was, it was the one that, it was like, um, I, I guess it, they, it wasn't new, they didn't call it the Newcastle earthquake, it was something else, but it was the one where a couple freeways collapsed. It was like in 1970, it must have been 72 maybe, 71, 72. And so our house, all of a sudden we wake up in the middle of the night, and these earthquakes always happen at night. They never happen in the day. It's like the monster movie where the monster's never around in the day, he's only there at night. And um, so we started having this earthquake and the whole house is shaking, it's really bad. And my parents are like, okay, we gotta get out, we gotta, you know, let's go get out in the middle of the street, come on, come on, come on. 
And I'm halfway down the stairs and I realize my stereo, you know, is up there. And my stereo was like, it was like the, it was like, it was like a pioneer and it was like three pieces, you know. And so I'm like running back up in the house and my mom is yelling at me, get out, Derry, you got to get out of there. And I'm like grabbing my stereo, you know. And my grandmother, uh, she comes running up. She's going, you got to get out of here. And I go, here, carry this, Grandma. And she's like got, you know, she's got one thing. And I go, no, don't. She's got the turntable. And it's like she's carrying it on the side. And I go, no, you got to hold it like this, you know. And she's walking down the stairs. So I, you know, saved my stereo from the, uh, from the big earthquake. And so that was, um, you know, my grandmother's life didn't matter as much then. As what the turntable is what mattered. So. No, heck no. No, she wouldn't like that at all. She'd ban me from doing that. So, yeah, but um, that's my earthquake story. So, I'm gonna play another one of my favorite songwriters. Um, anybody heard of Mary Gaucher? She's. Great. This is a song that's very, very appropriate for uh, for right now. My father could use a little mercy now. The fruits of his labor. Almost over, and it won't be long till he won't be around. I love my father, but he could use some mercy now. My brother.
mercy now. I know we don't deserve it, oh, but we need it anyhow. We hang in the balance, dangle between hell and hollow Thank you.